International Conference on Arts and Humanities. work 
and social order to become better citizens and human beings. One of the perennial issues for those of us in higher education is that of academic dishonesty by our students. Most faculty are reluctant to think much about this issue. Yet most surveys of students indicate the widespread use and toleration of cheating on college campuses. As this slide shows, a recent survey found that one-third of all students admitted to cheating on an exam, one half admitted to cheating on a class assignment, two-thirds admitted to cheating at least once during their college career, two-thirds have seen classmates cheat on exams or assignments. Interestingly, three-quarters of those in this survey believe that cheating is not justified under any circumstances. Finally, one half of the students surveyed believe that the faculty of their university don't try to catch cheaters. Cheaters abound even at the most prestigious universities. Nearly half of new students beginning at Harvard University last year admitted to cheating in their studies before they began their higher level of education. One-tenth of the incoming class said that they have cheated on an exam, while 42% admit to doing homework dishonestly, according to the results of a survey by the university's own newspaper, the Harvard Crimson. Yet, despite such a high number of students admitting to academic dishonesty, 84%, 84 percent, 84 percent of the 1,300 freshmen question say that academic work is their main priority. These results follow the largest cheating scandal at Harvard in recent memory, in which over 120 students were investigated for swapping answers on an exam in 2012. Those numbers sound bad enough, but research by a University of Wealth Management professor in Canada says that there may be even more cheaters among their first year students. Almost 60% of freshmen admit to cheating on tests in high school, and almost 75% on written work, according to a study just a few years ago by Julia Christensen Hughes who is the dean of the university's College of Management and Economics. Hughes says the most accepted kind of cheating among students is getting help from others when they are asked to work alone. And she says the parents are a part of the problem. She says culturally, students are being sent the message at home and by others in society, such as politicians, using questionable methods, and athletes using performance-enhancing drugs, that it's important to win at any cost. A scathing account of cheating among international students outside the United States stemmed from the fall 2002 administration of the graduate record exam, the GRE, with widespread incidents spanning China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, and India. Research suggests that students cheating on tests, engaging in plagiarism, and manufacturing fake diplomas and credentials are rampant throughout China's public and private universities. These types of cheating do not appear to be the result of a culture of cooperation, but rather the drive and the need for a competitive advantage. Now that was back in 2002. On, Jan on July the 13th, just last year, as many as 50 exam monitors were forced to take cover at a high school in Zhongshan, China, <coughs> fending off outraged students and some parents who yelled insults and threw stones at them after the monitors blocked cheating schemes on the all-important national Gao Kao exam. Hundreds of police responded to break up the riot, according to the Daily Telegraph of London. 
Metal detectors have found secret transmitters and contraband cell phones used by some who beamed in the exam answers from outside. Independent proctors had been assigned because of long-standing suspicions that the school's own proctors routinely condone or enable cheating. In fact, there were 99 identical papers, identical papers, submitted by 99 different students in one subject on the previous year's exam. One student in the mob of about 2,000 noting how widespread cheating is nationally in China, said, there is no fairness if you do not let us cheat also. <laughs> Researchers have begun to identify the facts that influence academic dishonesty and are cited in the book, Tools for Teaching, written by Barbara Gross Davis. These include competition and pressures for good grades, fear of failure, low self-esteem, instructional situations that are perceived as unfair or excessively demanding, faculty who are perceived as uncaring or indifferent to their own teaching or to their students' learning, neglectful attitudes on the part of faculty toward academic dishonesty, peer pressure to support a friend, and a diminishing sense of academic integrity and ethical values. Cultural factors in an institution also contribute to academic dishonesty in the classroom. According to author Anita Satterley, students continue to utilize the standard methods of cheating, such as cheat sheets, copying off of another student's test paper, or telling friends in the next class period what was covered on an exam. With access to the World Wide Web, and now direct access to the internet via smartphones, the opportunities to cheat are so much more readily accessible than they were even 10 years ago. In early December 2012, CNBC, the cable channel of NBC News, who I used to work for, Cable cast a program titled Faking the Grade, Classroom Cheaters. The program looks at cheating in schools and universities and shows an array of examples, not only by students, but also by parents who helped not only their children cheat, but teachers who falsified grades to make their institutions look better. It's a fascinating program that was actually produced by the Canadian Broadcasting Company. And I have a trailer that we should play here. Take a look. Online, do a Google search and look for cheating. Um, there are a lot of university students that even have programs, like a talk show about how to cheat. Uh, one is pretty scary because um, I saw one where uh, a student is wearing a low-cut blouse and inside her bra, had the answers. And when one of the professors came up to look at someone, this woman, for example, taking the test, she accused him of looking down her blouse. So there's some pretty scary things. It is morality and our conscience. Morality speaks of a system of conduct in regards to standards of right and wrong behavior. The word carries the concept of moral standards, moral responsibility, referring to our conscience and a moral identity, or one who is capable of right or wrong action. Common synonyms include ethics, principles, virtue, and goodness. But morality has become a complicated issue in this multicultural world that we all live in. Because in part, as I mentioned before, many countries and cultures view these standards differently. A study in 2004 showed differences in the perceptions of cheating behavior among international students. One study found that international students were almost, let's see, I think I've got the wrong one up here. Let's see if I can go back. No, don't have that one. 
One study found that international students were almost five times more likely to be accused of an honor offense than domestic students. The study attributed a higher proportion of accusations against international students in that students coming from highly collectivist cultures would tend to work together on individual assignments. Now, my personal experience, having lived and taught as a Fulbright scholar for a year and a half in China, was that many of the students didn't feel plagiarism, copying someone else's words, was bad. Now, I haven't had a chance to talk with my colleagues here from China. And I'm married to a Chinese woman, so I do have a little bit of knowledge about the country. But my students at Tsinghua University, I asked them about plagiarism, about using other person's, people's words. Many of them cited the fact that when books were difficult to come by in China, people would memorize passages, chapters, and even entire books of significance. Many felt that it was an honor, a tribute to the author, to recite word for word what the scholar had written with no need for attribution or giving credit. Now, I gave a speech at one university in Guangzhou, in the southern part of China, on the topic of investigative journalism. The coordinator of the event asked if I could provide him with a copy of my speech in advance. So I sent him my attachment, or an attachment by my email. Upon my arrival at the event, I was told that a group of eight students who were researching and writing a paper on investigative journalism wanted to present their findings before my presentation began. I agreed, and I listened to these students in disbelief as they recited the first page of my prepared speech word for word. At that time, having lived and taught in China for about six months, I knew better than to displace those students. So while they were discussing their findings, I hurriedly rewrote the first page of my speech. Morality impacts on our everyday decisions, and those choices are directed by our conscience. We must decide for ourselves where the conscience originates. Many people hold the idea that the conscience is a matter of our hearts, that concepts of right, wrong, and fairness are programmed in each of us. Morality describes the principles that govern our behavior. And without these principles in place, societies cannot survive for long. In today's world, morality is frequently thought of as belonging to a particular religious point of view. But this is not the case. Everyone adheres to a moral doctrine of some kind. Morality as it relates to our behavior is important on these three levels. Renowned thinker, scholar, and author C.S. Lewis defines them as number one, to ensure fair play and harmony between individuals. Number two, to help make us good people in order to have a good society. And three, to keep us in a good relationship with the power that created us. Based upon this definition, it's clear that our beliefs are critical to our moral behavior. On the first point, Professor Lewis says most reasonable people agree to ensure fair play and harmony. By the second point, we begin to see some problems. Consider the popular philosophy, I'm not hurting anyone but myself. It's frequently used to excuse bad personal choices. How can we be the good people we need to be if we persist in making these choices? And how will that result not affect the rest of our society? Bad personal choices do hurt others. Take the cases of former President Bill Clinton and his lover, and superstar golfer, here's seen with his wife before, his ex-wife, Tiger Woods, who finally admitted that they had not only hurt their wives and children, but also hurt close friends and others deeply with their affairs. 
Now the third point is where disagreement surfaces. That third point again being to keep us in a good relationship with the power that created us. While the majority of the world's population believes in God, or at least in a God, the question of creation as a theory of origins continues to be hotly debated in today's society. A recent report in Psychology Today concludes the most significant predictor of a person's moral behavior may be religious commitment. People who consider themselves very religious were least likely to report deceiving their friends, having extramarital affairs, cheating on their expense accounts, or even parking illegally. Based on this finding, what we believe about creation has a decided effect on our moral thinking and our behavior. Without belief in a creator, the only option that seems to be left is to adhere to moral standards we make up for ourselves. Unless we live in a dictatorial society, we are free to choose our own personal moral code. Those who do not believe in God are left with only one possible conclusion. That is, that our decisions are based solely on our need to survive. What we call our conscience then would be based on learned behavior rather than part of a divine design. Manipulation and treachery for good and evil go back thousands of years. Modern man seems to have innate tendencies to manipulate. It has been suggested that genes for lying play a crucial role in propagating our species. Therefore, the ability to lie is rooted in our DNA. Some people excel at falsehood. These natural liars are usually quite aware of their talents, since they have deceived parents and teachers to escape punishment in their early youth. They are confident and feel no fear or guilt about getting caught. Yet they are not sociopaths. They don't use their skills to hurt other people, and in fact they score the same as other people on psychological profiles. But they seem to do better in certain careers. Can you think of any natural writers, careers? Sales, politics, acting, negotiating, and my favorite, the legal profession, all lawyers. One book titled Cheating in College, Why Students Do It, and what educators can do about it, was published in 2012. In their book, the authors presented their findings at American universities, and they outlined the causes of student cheating, and they offer solutions. The authors focus on honor codes and promote the benefits of these honor codes at universities. And they say cheating habits among college students develop prior to arriving at the university which we've talked a little bit about before, and you saw that with the, um, the DVD. They say cheating habits among these college students, um, two-thirds of them are engaged in some form of cheating. They state that a major shift has occurred in cheating and related attitudes, and the authors of this book believe it is now rampant in professional schools. They also found in their research the following groups were more prone to cheat. Men, younger students, athletes, fraternity, and sorority members, and those involved in extracurricular activities. One form of cheating or manipulation that affects us the most as journalists and educators is the topic of plagiarism. It remains a constant problem in part because it encompasses such a wide variety of errors in academic writing. In fact, plagiarism can be a difficult term to define for our students. Copying material from a book or other source without acknowledging that the words or ideas are someone else's and not yours is, of course, plagiarism. But if you use someone else's ideas, only their ideas, even if you paraphrase the wording, 
appropriate credit needs to be given. Although instructors frequently warn students not to plagiarize essays, issuing dire warnings about failing grades or even expulsion, plagiarism continues to be a problem according to author Stephen Woolhart. He is an assistant professor at the University of Dayton in Ohio. For many of us, plagiarism is a highly emotional issue. A suspected instance of plagiarism can transform a caring, reflective teacher into an academic cop, judge, jury, and executioner. Even though there always will be dishonest students, most cases of plagiarism result from honest confusion over the standards of academic discourse and proper citation. Those of us who are educators might more successfully combat the problem by spending additional time in class helping our students learn how to avoid it. Following ideas are designed to help impart to students the values of honesty and to help set policies that encourage academic integrity. Some specific steps that can be taken to prevent academic dishonesty are one, spend time at the beginning of the term discussing standards of academic scholarship and conduct. Cheating may mean different things for faculty and for students. For example, students are often unclear about how much they can work with other students and under what circumstances. Number two, describe acceptable and unacceptable behavior, giving examples of plagiarism, impermissible collaboration, other practices relevant to our classes. Three, explain how cheating harms students and that cheating won't be tolerated. Discuss university policies, procedures, and penalties for academic violations. Some schools and departments hand out written materials that define cheating and plagiarism and require students to sign a statement that they have read and understood the material. I do this in my classes. Columbia University in New York City has gone one step further. Last year, it instituted the requirement that students write on the first page of any exam, I certify that the work I have undertaken in this exam is entirely my own. And they must sign their names to that statement. Number four, take visible actions to detect dishonesty so that students know you will not tolerate cheating, and if cheating occurs, respond swiftly with disciplinary measures and formal action. And number five, perhaps most in the country, there should be either a specific required course or a campus-wide forum for newly entering students to acclimate them to the culture of academic responsibility on campus and to explain the expected code of conduct for members of an academic community. Such a course or activity early on in the first term on campus could help articulate the concept of academic dishonesty. In closing, there is a greater need to focus on altering student attitudes towards cheating, since these attitudes are developed in middle school and high school. Identifying the reasons that particular groups are more inclined to cheat and what can be done to address these tendencies. It is incumbent upon every one of us not only to teach, but also to continue to reinforce ethical and moral behavior, quality standards, and those core values that will positively impact not only our students, but our colleagues and our co-workers to lead them to become stronger, more hardworking, and successful citizens in our society and in our world. Thank you.